Good afternoon colleagues and consultants. My name is Dr. Ali. Topic for the day is VBAT, vaginal birth after cesarean section, supervised by Dr. Massimella. In this presentation, I will cover background history of VBAT, criteria for VBAT, contraindications, risks versus benefits, factors influencing successful VBAT, antenatal counseling, intrapartum management, postpartum management, complications, and an important message in conclusion. The increased rates of cesarean in the past decades owed much to dictums, once a cesarean, always a cesarean. Luckily, Craig's low transverse uterine incision reduced maternal mortality and morbidity. Rethinking dictum gave an excellent review on VBAC showing 70% success rate in the British population. Also, Flammetel reported a successful figure 70 to 80% of VBAC. Between 1985 and 1996, the rates of vaginal birth after cesarean section increased steadily. Since the mid 90s, however, medical legal issues and concerns about the risk of uterine rupture have contributed to a reversal in the trend. The following criteria is important to qualify for VBAC. Patient consent, prior lower transverse cesarean delivery, maximum one, clinically adequate pelvis, vertex presentation, no other uterine scars or previous uterine rupture, capable of monitoring labor and performing an emergency cesarean delivery if need be. There are few absolute contraindications to vaginal birth after the cesarean section. Previous uterine rupture, according to literature, 6% risk for future rupture with a previous lower segment rupture versus 32% with a previous upper segment rupture. Previous classical incision on the uterus, two or more previous cesarean sections and if the patient refuses to consent. It's important to weigh the risks versus the benefits and individualize it for each patient. Risks include increased rates of uterine rupture, 0.1 to 2.5% according to the WHO multi-country survey in 2016, increased rates of perinatal deaths, according to the Dutch population is steady 4.5%, maternal age more than 30, fetal weight more than 400 grams, previous classical incision on the uterus. On the other hand, the benefits include lower rates of maternal morbidity, including decreased postpartum fever, wound infection, blood transfusion, maternal discomfort, hysterectomy and length of stay, and lower rate of neonatal respiratory distress. Factors influencing success of VBAC. Previous vaginal birth before seizure. This is the single best predictor with a success rate of 85 to 90%. Indication for the previous seizure and the following are grouped under associated with VBAC failure. Age more than 35 years, BMI more than 30 kilos per meter square, diabetes and hypertensive disorders, Bishop's score, which is poor at the time of admission before delivery, macrosomia, birth weight more than 4 kg. During antenatal, counseling and documentation are very important. Women with one prior and complicated lower segment cesarean section at term should be counseled for VBAC, explaining the risks and benefits. Final decision should be documented before the expected or planned delivery date, ideally before 36 weeks. Placenta previa or accreta should be ruled out using ultrasound. Interpartum management. Women willing to undergo vaginal birth after caesarean section are considered high risk and must ideally deliver at a unit with a theater facility anesthetic and pediatric availability, and an on-site blood transfusion services. Continuous CTG is recommended following the onset of uterine contractions. Abnormal CTG is most consistent finding of uterine rupture and is present in 55 to 85% of events. 
40 gram progress of labor enhances safety and should be plotted timely. Uterine catheter in active phase of labor should be considered as hematuria is also a sign of uterine rupture and can be identified easily. Epidural anesthesia for labor and adequate pain relief should be encouraged. Induction of labor with oxytocin or prostaglandins is independent risk factor of uterine rupture in women with scarred uterus. Use of misoprostol as an induction agent in women with a previous scar is associated with increased risk of uterine rupture of 5.6%. Unlike prostaglandins or oxytocin, cervical ripening with transcervical Foley catheter in women with a previous caesarean delivery is not associated with increased risk of uterine rupture. Surgical techniques. There was concerns raised after the Canadian study reported increased risk of uterine rupture with a previous single layer closure. However, the Cronus trial concluded that there is no difference in maternal deaths or pregnancy complications associated with single and double layer uterine closure. Postpartum. According to the RCOG guidelines, women undergoing vaginal birth after caesarean section compared with emergency repeat caesarean section have significantly greater incidence of blood transfusion, but the likelihood of hysterectomy is not increased. There are two main complications associated with vaginal birth after caesarean section, uterine rupture and placenta previa or morbidly adhered placenta. Uterine rupture. Uterine rupture is a rare complication, but it has potentially catastrophic implication for both mom and baby. It's associated with high maternal and fetal mortality and morbidity. And fortunately, there is no single pathognomic clinical feature to indicate uterine rupture, but following are peripartum signs that may indicate the possibility of uterine rupture abnormal CTG tracing, severe abdominal pain persisting in midst of contractions, acute onset of scar tenderness, maternal tachycardia, cessation of previously efficient uterine activity, hypertension and shock, loss of cessation of presenting pulp, abnormal vaginal bleeding and hematuria. Role of ultrasound. Measurement of thickness of lower uterine segments by ultrasound in the third trimester can be performed and a value of more than or equal to 3.5 millimeters have been found to carry a significant negative predictive value of 99.3%. It's also been reported that uterine rupture and dehiscence was directly related to thickening of the lower segment at around 37 weeks with positive predictive value of only 11.8%. However, there is no evidence that measurement of thickness of lower segment is superior to careful clinical practice in prevention of uterine rupture. It's important to recognize the causes of uterine rupture during pregnancy, labor, and post-delivery, and be trained and equipped to manage in the case of unfortunate event. Causes during pregnancy include previous classical caesarean section, previous hysterotomy, previous myomectomy, placenta accreta, motor vehicle accidents, malaria anomalies of uterus, hysteroscopic metroplasty, difficult curatage for miscarriage. Causes during labor to be vigilant about include previous caesarean section, previous myomectomy, grand multiparity, malpresentation, instrumental delivery, and recognized cephalopelvic disproportion, obstructed labor, prostaglandin and oxytocin augmentation, and assisted breach delivery. Post delivery causes include precipitant labor, manual removal of the placenta, uterine manipulation, and placenta accreta. Incidence of uterine rupture has been reported according to the site and type of uterine scar. Highest incidence has been involved in two previous lower segment is car and the highest incidence reported is 3.7%. And 
previous classical or inverted T or J shaped incision in which the highest incident reported is 4 to 9 percent. Placenta previa, the second major complication of vaginal birth after cesarean section. According to the RCOG guidelines, major degree of placenta previa and some cases of minor or partial placenta previa is contraindicated to vaginal delivery, including vaginal birth after cesarean section. A systemic review reported that women with one, two, or three or more previous cesarean deliveries experience 1%, 1.7%, or 2.8% risk respectively of placenta previa in subsequent pregnancies. Placenta accreta occurs in 1 to 14% of women with placenta previa and one times prior cesarean delivery. 23 to 40% risk in women with placenta previa and two times prior cesarean deliveries. In women with placenta previa and five or more times more prior cesarean deliveries, the incidence of placenta accreta is up to 67%. In conclusion, women who have undergone a previous cesarean delivery have the option of proceeding with trial of labor after cesarean or planned repeat cesarean delivery in subsequent pregnancy. Planned trial of labor after caesarean may result in labor with vaginal birth or unplanned intrapartum caesarean delivery. Decision making regarding the mode of delivery must take into consideration patient's personal preference, obstetric history, scientific data on risk and benefits of trial of labor after caesarean versus planned repeat caesarean delivery and availability of trial of labor after caesarean in a selected birth setting. The two major concerns that women have when making this decision are the chances of successful VBAC and chances of uterine rupture. Therefore, in-depth counseling is of utmost importance. And with that, I thank you for your time.